are either watching or listening to The Climb. And my name is John Siracus, and this is brought to you by The Digital Mastermind. Today, we have a fantastic show with a gentleman by the name of Jay Owen. But before I'd like to get into that, we're talking about building businesses. And right now, we're, we're, we're in a climate which is not going to be as easy as the one before. Not that I'm here to say some doom and gloom, but... The writing is on the wall. We've had a monstrous economy up to a certain point. And now we're reaching a, a certain time where inflation is getting higher. Prices of things are going up. So decisions and sacrifices will have to be made. But in doing that, the thing that you have to take care of most are the people that are around you. And those are, of course, your employees and your clients. And that's a lot about what we talked about with our, with our guests today. Uh, Jay Owen. But before we get into all that, Dave, why don't you come out here? Hey, how's it going? It's going well. So I know we were talking about in the pre-show for this show, a little bit about starting out in like the 2008, 2009, when, when we started, where are some of the things that you remember? Because that wasn't the easiest economic climate to, to start a business in. It wasn't, but I thought, I think we were positioned to take the greatest advantage of the situation because we had low overhead. Um, you know, you know, when we started out, you didn't have anything. You didn't have any of the commitments and the you you could just go in and underbid somebody by 50%. And and you were getting, you know, as long as you could back it up, then you got the work. I mean, so I feel like now since we've grown, we, you know, we're 12 years from two, you know, from the last financial collapse. We're on a different, we're on the different side of the the, the scenario. And um I, I guess the only thing though that could be our advantage though is that the, kind of the workforce has been completely uh, resigned yeah like nobody wants to work so there's no there's no young people hustling like we were in 2008 trying to start an agency what i also think is interesting too is speaking with others that have started their agency or even people that you know for working from from other countries they're all wise to what the rates are so i don't think i was wise to what the rates were when I started. So I was like, I was undercutting. I was, I was really, really low and just trying to figure out how to rub those two pennies together. I haven't seen as much of that lately, but we'll see. It gets dog eat dog when things get really tough and your, your back is against the wall. But the flip side, it, things are getting more expensive, um, but there's so many businesses that are still entering the market. I think when we see businesses slow down entering the market, less concepts coming out, then I think we'll see uh, a real stalemate. Are, are you like business is measured in terms of confidence in the future? Mm -hmm. How confident in the future are you? I mean, you're talking to guys. I mean, I kind of exude a lot of confidence. <laughs> I'm right? confident it's in myself in adapting to whatever the future holds. Yeah, sure. But your view of the future is bleak. I would imagine, just like everyone else's. I mean, we yeah, right now with inflation going up, I'm concerned for other people, I'm not concerned for myself. I'm, yeah, because we'll be last hit, or or we'll be on the back end of the affected. Yeah, um, but I also yeah, think it's I something think... to be able to take a punch, right? Even when you mm -hmm. are hit, you're like, all right, cool, I can I can figure this out. Yeah, but uh, yeah, inflation's just eating up savings. Uh, we're on the verge of maybe a war, which is ridiculous. Uh, there is just. You know, and a lot of the headlines and shit in the news that I'm reading, I, half of it I feel like is just fake or just thrown out there. There's so much news. There's too much news. Mm -hmm. um, but there's definitely a negative a negative uh, cloud uh, over the, you know, over the, in the horizon. I mean, there's, it's hard for anyone I'm talking to saying, yeah, I'm so excited about these opportunities. Yeah. And I also think you touched on the point, though, too, with just pulling in the staff to be able to to execute on it. I know a ton of agencies are just struggling to to find the right people. And this is a this is a tip for any agency. And I even think our, our guest, Jay, we mentioned it. You can't ask anybody to to come in at a full time basis to your office. And if you are, I mean, you're doing yourself a disservice. You need to be as flexible as possible. I, I just had that thought this morning. I walking through our empty office here, I was like, the allure and fun of running a business isn't even, isn't even as fun as it is anymore without people in the office. Like, I, I'm starting to feel like, man, this is boring coming into this office. Yeah. Yeah. No, I'm with you. I The same thing. I need the, the change of stage, but I loved 
walking around, chatting with people, finding out what's going on with them. Now it's a Slack message. How are you doing? Fine. <laughs> it's like it's like talking to your kids. Like, hey, how, how was school today? Fine. What did you learn? Nothing. It's like, all right. Yeah. You got you know, any homework? Gonna, no. Yeah. <laughs> so, yeah. Trying to trying to cheer them up. Yeah. Some of those things are lost. And I guess this is our our adapting, right? We're we're trying to to reconnect with the way that we wanted it to be, and maybe we'll find some some semblance of that, or not. Who knows? We might get rid of these offices in the next year. Oh, I'm definitely at least going to downgrade it. You know, we don't need the the square footage that we had. So, um, you know, put a wall, cut it in half, and you know, let the other half go. But so you know, like we were talking, I don't know, two weeks ago, I'm driving down our main drag here at the beach. And the <clears throat> excuse me, the amount of four lease signs that I'm seeing in office buildings, it was noticeably increased. So I'm like, all right, this is real Main Street. I'm seeing it. You know, I'm noticing it, and that usually leads to a bad, uh, you know, worse economy because if you've got all this available office space that's just sitting empty, you know, the uh, there was a restaurant that was in a an awesome location that I it was empty. And I was like shocked that it was empty. It was a popular restaurant. Yeah. And it will, it'll be interesting to see what happens when like this, the, the full commercial fallout occurs. If there is one, I think they, there, there is opportunity for them to adapt and do different types of things with mixed use spaces and, and, and whatnot. But I think the point I was trying to make in today's monologue, which I don't believe is stronger than the others. And I promise to endeavor to do a better one next time is that, Building an agency or any business is not easy because it's people, right? Right. People are variables. They get confused. They get upset. They get excited. They get tired. All of these different things happen. And then when you have clients that are bombarded with things that are potentially messing with their confidence, and then you have employees that are potentially pulling them away that the grass is greener on the other side and you can get this and you don't have to go into work that this is all turmoil as business owners and business leaders that we need to figure out how to navigate this thing. Because at the end of the day, the more people that we have satisfied in those two different buckets, the better things are going to tend to be for us, right? right. We want that as, as, as good leaders. So now starting an agency and trying to scale and trying to grow and really controlling your culture in this climate, my hat's off to you anybody that's doing it right now. Cause I think we're in a way better position. We've got, you know, 15 something years experience in, in, in attempting this and we have a pretty healthy position that we're in. So God bless you. I'm interested to see how it turns out for you. Well, one of the biggest things you mentioned there is, is, is controlling like the, the, this is why like the open book managements I've always questioned, like the, the, the information overload for an employee in good times. It's great. You know, hey, give me more information. I want to be involved in the company. And in a scary environment, you want to limit the amount of stuff they're worrying about. Because mm -hmm. if they're worrying about everything, they're not doing the, their job for you. They're they're worried. They're scared. You know, in a in a down in a, in a downturn, they're they're scared. So. You know, and I think it's almost akin to like having like a police scanner where you're hearing like, oh, hey, this is the type of crime that got committed. First, looking into the dossiers and the actual facts of what went down in those individual crimes and getting into the nitty gritty details like that would be like horrifying and terrifying on some level. I think a right. lot of it, and I, we're both believers of this. Yeah. It, it surface. I want you as happy as you can be doing the thing that you're supposed to do only worrying about the things that pertain to your function. When you get into this other realm, people are like, Oh, well it helps with cost savings and some of those. I think good stewardship helps with cost savings. You, you, you don't have to put that weight on your employees. Right. And just like when the whole COVID everything started, you know, our mission instantly turned to build up a cash reserve as much as we can and so that we can be prepared for, for you know, any kind of downturn. And that, and that is, to your point you just said, good stewardship, you know. We, so we saw what the future risks might be and we started answering those two years ago. And we're in a good position to survive anything. I agree. Speaking of positions, that's what we talked about a lot with our guest here, Jay Owen. So go ahead and uh, give a listen. We talk about everything from processes and from uh, treating your employees, treating your clients and building that agency that you want today. And 
Go ahead and like, share, comment, do something with this show. It'll be greatly appreciated. And if you'd like to join the Digital Mastermind, go ahead and shoot me an email, john, J-O-N, at digitalmastermind.com. Thank you so much for tuning in, and we'll see you next time. Bye now. Hi, Jay. Thank you so much for joining us. Hey, John. Thanks for having me. Oh, man. Great to have you here. So uh, first question I'd like to start with is tell us about your climb. How did you get here? Well, it's a long story, but I'll make it short. Um, you know, I started by myself many, many years ago. I've been in business for 23 years. And, um, you know, I think it's easy to start something. That keeping it going, it's a little bit tricky. And so I started when I was 17. I was a kid uh, in high school building websites. And um, I had an internship at a company for a little while and then started my own business. But the first year I made about $5,000. It's hard to keep uh, keep much going on that. And uh and over time, you know, I, I did it all by myself for a long time and and, um, and worked for about 10 years solo, plus contractors here and there before I started bringing on a real team. And, um, you know, I struggled in the early years, wondering if I could even make it work. I, I remember specifically saying to my wife, I wonder if I'll ever make enough money just to cover my own time for the whole week. And um, it took me a while to figure all that out, honestly. So uh, I struggled in the early days, but uh, we've grown every single year for 23 years in a row. And um, last year was a close call, but we uh, managed to squeeze out growth. And um, it's been a lot of fun. Right on, man. So 17, not trying to date you or age you, like what year, what year was that? Like when you started? 1999. 1999. And what got you into websites? Was there something specific that called to you? I mean, I was just kind of a geek at an early age, you know, I liked, I've always loved technology. I like new things. And so, you know, I started building websites really when they first started coming out, you know, back in the like pre-internet bulletin board service days, yeah. World Wide web just coming out. Netscape Navigator was big. Alta Vista was the search engine, you know, um, not, that really dates me going back that far. AOL was like, you know, the way the internet was used and, um, and so I built websites like from a really young age, like, you know, 11, 12 years old, I built my first website. And over time, you know, you get good at something early and somebody goes, oh, I need a website. And I'm like, oh, I could build you one of those. It'll be like a hundred dollars, you know, <laughs> and uh, they weren't great. But at the time it was the best I could do and it was better than what they had. And, and so I eventually just started doing that. And I, and I picked up, like I said, an internship when I was about 16 years old at a company uh, here in Florida. And, um, and from that, you know, I've always had that entrepreneurial spirit. Uh, I, I think it, I think it's partially ingrained in me, but I think it's partially just from seeing other people. My grandfather ran an, a restaurant chain. My uncle runs an insurance business. I think when you see family or other people around you like that, it helps you kind of grow towards it. It's part of the reason why I'm no good at golf. Cause I had nobody in my life was any good at golf. And I think, you know, you got to kind of grow up in it. <laughs> the other day I got to play for the first time in a while. It was, it was not pretty, um, but I think that for me, it was just, I just love technology from an early age. I'm, I'm naturally curious. And so I just played with it. And then it turned out people were willing to pay for that. And then I like running businesses. And so I thought, wow, if I can make money doing things I actually like to do, that would be fun. It's not always been fun, but you know, that's how it started. Yeah. And then what were you charging? You said a hundred bucks, but like, let's say uh, like 2002, that like, what were you, what were you charging for website center? What well, it's funny. Cause I remember like in the very early days, somebody asked me like, uh, how much does it cost to build a website? I don't remember why I remember this conversation. And I was like, well, for like a really nice one, it would be like $500. Um, <laughs> and, but that was, I mean, back then 500 bucks when you're 17 years old is a lot of money, you yeah, know, and yeah, it, it was so. just me playing on my computer as far as I was concerned. Uh, but in the early years, you know, we, we, for a long time, we, I think we were doing stuff for a couple thousand dollars. And, you know, one of the things I struggled with actually early in, in uh, business was, you know, I didn't come from money. I'd never seen a lot of money. I hadn't been around a lot of money. My dad drove a UPS truck um, and he worked really hard doing that. But the idea of like charging $10,000, for example, for a project was like, boof, you know? And so yeah. I had these almost like glass ceiling numbers in my head. And I think I still do sometimes. I think I get to numbers and I'm like, you know, back in the day it was like, well, $5,000 is a lot of money. And then it was like, oh, $10,000 is a lot of money. Well, I could never charge more than $50,000. Well, we could never charge more than a hundred, you know? And that, that's that been a problem for me over time of just kind of reassessing my mindset. Well, what's the real value that we're actually bringing here to this customer? And, and what are they able to pay that actually makes sense that aligns with the value that we deliver? And so, you know, I've literally gone from building websites in some cases that were a couple hundred dollars back in the day to, you know, things that are tens of thousands or even hundred thousand plus type projects now. 
And I've struggled with that too. I'm so happy that you've mentioned that. There were certain things, but it's literally building a case for myself of, all right, what's the reality of this and the value? And then actually practicing, like saying, that's going to be $100,000. Like just being really confident. I mean, do you have similar things that have helped you along the way? Yeah, I mean, sometimes it's had to it's had to be me being around other agency owners or leaders, or and, and I'll tell them a price and they're like, what? You're charging... <laughs> You should put a zero on the end of that. And I'm like, there's no way somebody would pay that. Matter of fact, I mean, this still happens. Like uh, I started doing um, a lot of workshops where we'll go in or I'll go in and I will teach messaging frameworks to company, larger companies, internal marketing teams. Mm -hmm. So uh, I just did one recently for a large company. Uh, got another one I just signed up for. And um, I'm doing it through an organization called StoryBrand, uh, who people yeah. may have heard from uh, building a story brand by Donald Miller. Yep. And I'm a certified trainer through them. And so when they tell us what their minimum price guidelines are, and this was like a couple of years ago, I was like, there's no way somebody's going to pay me that for a workshop. I'm just going to go in and teach. And they're going to pay me that much. That's, that's crazy. And uh, they're like, just do it. And sure enough, turns out people actually pay that much. But, and then, and then what happens for me is like, I hit that number and I'm like, okay, well that's the new number. Nobody's yeah. going to pay more than that. But then you see people all the time who go in and do talks. I mean, obviously, you know, people that are much more famous than me, but um you know, he'll go in and get paid 50 grand for an hour long talk at a keynote. And you're like, what? But they're bringing that value to that event because of who they are or what their topic is or what their content is or who they're speaking to or who they're drawing at the event. And, and I think that's been a real struggle for me is like resetting those price valuations over time and really understanding what is the value I'm bringing to somebody else. Because if I'm, if I'm charging somebody, you know, a hundred grand for something, I want it to make them a million dollars. You know, and um, and same thing if it's 10 grand, I want, I want it to make them 10x, you know, and that doesn't always happen. It's not always that perfect. I wish that it was. Um, but but that that uh, pricing has been definitely a struggle for me over time. And, and ultimately, it's just come with other people saying, hey, you're going to lose that project if you're priced that low. They're, they're not going to believe that you're good enough. And that's and, like, and I've heard that as well when it's value based pricing. Is that typically what you do? Value based pricing? Uh, for the most part. So a lot of our stuff is packaged based on, you know, the value of the project. Um, it, it's probably not what, what people that are like real value based priced experts. Like I've had a few guys on my podcast who, I mean, that's their lane, you know, oh, and they're yeah. really hyper value pricing every single project. We really are more like packaged project based pricing for the most part, or we've kind of pre-decided, Hey, these set of things are going to cost this much. Um, and then there are still some things that we do kind of traditional time and material for, if you will, like development projects that are a little bit harder to scope. Uh, sometimes those get kind of estimated and then over just get, get billed hourly. But I try to avoid hourly billing whenever possible. Yeah. So we're, we're more hourly. And I think that just plays into like my, my logic sense. And the, I, I agree with the packages. I've done packages before, but we would, you go above and beyond. Sometimes you become the abused spouse in yep, a relationship. hundred percent. Um, so you have to have good boundaries on that. And I, and I did some fantastic agencies that do it really well. Just, you know, ours is just a little bit different, but I remember, so we were having a, a, a digital mastermind event and there was an expert who brought up value-based pricing and he was called it discriminate, uh, uh, discrimination pricing. Right. Mm. And I was like, damn, that just sounds so ugly. He's like, oh no, no, it doesn't. It's when somebody, let's say that you're, you're talking to Pepsi and they come in and they say, we need a new logo. You're like, well, what's that? What's the, the value of that logo to you? And I was just like, I just can't. It just, it's uh, granted, I can make a ton of money doing that. I just, it's not my DNA to to do it that way. So I, I yeah, understand I where you're coming from, where it's just like, all right, it's either packages or or hours. And at the same, I think those are very synonymous. I think it's a completely different style on the on the other side. Well, I always tell people, ignore the system, but have a system. So what I mean by that mm -hmm. is like, just because I'm doing it one way doesn't mean you have to do it that way. It's mm -hmm. an idea, though, and something you could try. Just because you do it some way doesn't mean somebody else needs to copy your particular system. There's no point in reinventing the wheel, but many times there are, especially with the world that we're in, in the agency space, there's a lot of different things. I've been to events before where they'll do like a debate and they'll have like one person on stage that's like the hourly person and the other yeah, person's like the, the value-based person. And I think what I enjoy out of those is you'll see two people on stage who are both very successful good at what they do, have been doing it for a very long time, and both of the ways that they do it work for them. 
Yep. And that's good enough for me. And so I'm not like a evangelist for either one of those sides of billing. It's just that if I come across somebody who's not very profitable at all, there's a, there's a lot of options to help figure that out, you know, and they need a better system. But the nice thing about hourly is as long as it's planned right, you never lose money. And uh, in and, and project-based or packages or value, you do it wrong, you can really burn yourself. And I've done that too. Yeah, no, and I think we we fell into that category, and and also like from from a, a scalability standpoint, value based to me just started to break down, right? So that's yeah. where it was like, okay, with with hours, I mean, we're tracked. You're here. This is what it uh, essentially is going to cost. Um, but 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 in that, what do you do? You work with agencies too? Well, I do a little bit of agency coaching. So okay. um, I'll, I'll coach agency leaders who need help. And matter of fact, I just heard about, I, I don't know how I didn't know about it before, but I just heard about y'all's Digital Mastermind Summit and all that stuff. And I don't, I don't know how I'm, either. I would love to go. So, <laughs> yeah, um, yeah, yeah. and so we're actually, I was, I started working on an event, um, which we're going to do next March in St. Augustine Beach. And then I saw yours and I was like, well, shoot, this is kind of what we're doing. So I need to talk to this guy, but we can do that another time. We're going to have to <laughs> So let's, let's talk challenges, right? Yeah. So, uh, challenges are, you know, meaty, sexy. Those are the things that everybody loves. Tell me what, what are some of the biggest challenges that you've come over? What is one of the biggest challenges that you've overcome? Yeah. I mean, we talked about money a little bit and, and pricing, but I think that the biggest challenge for me over time has been just the idea of letting go of responsibilities and work. You know, it's that belief of like, if you want to get it done right, you got to do it yourself. And, um, and that's just really not true. I mean, you know, I used to do it all myself. And I assure you that absolutely everything that we do as an agency is infinitely better than when I did it by myself. Mm. And so I think learning to delegate well, not just delegate tasks, but delegate outcomes, learning how to hire well, learning how to get the right people in the right seats. I mean, those were things that just were like, you know, I learned the hard way and I wish I'd had a better plan and better mentors around me in the early years of trying to get that right. Did you seek out mentors like, so eventually I did. Um, one of the things that's been most helpful to me is being in groups of other agencies. I think that one of the positives of our industry, for the most part, at least the people that I'm around, is it's pretty transparent. Like, I mean, I'll tell you anything you want to know about how we run things or how we price them or what our margins are. Like, I'm, I'll do it publicly. I, it doesn't bother me at all. I'm happy to share that stuff. Because I just believe in a big blue ocean and there's plenty of opportunity out there for all of us. There's more opportunity than there is time to get it done. Um, and so being in groups of other agency leaders helped me a lot. You know, I remember one particular organization I joined uh, years ago. And when I showed up, I think I had like, I don't know, three or four team members or something. And I was just still just in the weeds deep. And I remember there were like groups and they would separate groups based on sizes sometimes and bring people in for different talks and things. And, you know, I always was like, man, I want to be in that like 10 plus team member group because those people seem to at least not be like drowning. And um, and so I just asked a lot of questions. It was all that in between time. You know, um, it wasn't a one particular person, really. It was just a lot of different people who gave me input over time and also just being willing to go, hey, I really suck at this and I need help. You know, I think for a long time I was so my my personality style is so like. I want to get it right all the time. And I, and I carry the weight of like thinking that it's all my responsibility and I have to know how to do it. And I just don't, you know, and I think that was a big thing for me of going, Hey, I need some help here. I need, I need somebody to help me. I can't always be the one who always has all the answers because I don't, I'm not that smart. Uh, despite what my ego might say to me sometimes. Yeah, no. And I, I had some, some similar, uh, some similar instances. I remember I was lucky enough to, to find this group, which I, I now manage I got a cold call one day from a guy um, who used to manage a uh, great guy, Jeff Klein. And um, like, he just started talking about all these things in the agency world. I was like, dude, I, I don't even know what you're talking about, man, but I, I want to know more. And he's like, all right, then, then you should come to our event. But there is like imposter syndrome, uh, oh, yeah. syndrome, just being super insecure about like, all right, I'm about to tell all these people I really suck at my main function, which is supposed to be running this agency. Right. But <laughs> once you get past that, it's, it's so much more fulfilling. And I, and I think you brought up another point I've seen in other industries. I was talking to somebody in logistics yesterday. They said their core value was honesty. I was like, yeah, but that's table stakes. They said, not in the transportation business. They said, uh -huh. everybody lies. When the truck's going to be there, whether the trucks broke down, it's like, that's, that's a big differentiator for us. 
Um, and then to that, um, they 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 won't share any of their uh, you know their pricing or anything. Everything's confidential. I think in the agency realm, the culture is pretty good for the most part. It, most of the you know good agencies um, exude the same things that you do. Like, hey, I'm just going to tell you, I'm going to tell you where we're at. You know, yeah. we're going to win or we're not going to win, but regardless, this isn't going to be used against me. And I think that's a huge powerful point about where our industry is going. Yeah, I think that's a real blessing, honestly, because I mean, I've I've not run across people who I ask a tough question to and they're like, yeah, we're not sharing that. Like, I think that's what people don't do sometimes. And I think sometimes maybe we don't ask those questions because we're scared of somebody to know what our answer is. You know, we start talking about things like, I mean, shoot, when I started a business, I couldn't have told you the difference between a gross margin and a net margin anyway. I'd yeah. have been like, well, I don't, I don't even know what you mean. So I'm, <laughs> sitting, I'm sitting there in the conversation going, mm -hmm, yeah, that sounds good. I'm, I don't know. I quit college. I, I didn't, I didn't learn these fundamentals, you know? And so um, I think being willing to like, it's like, I don't know. It's like being willing to be seen with your shirt off at the gym and you're not you've not been to the gym, you know, like you, you need somebody to go, Hey, let me help you fix this. And, um, and I think again, like I said, for me, it, it wasn't just one specific mentor, but I think that the, the thing that was probably the biggest catalyst for me in my own personal growth. And then as a result, my agency's growth was, it was groups. It was two. But I, and I really believe in, in, in doing two different things. One, that's an agency specific group, or I would I should just say industry specific group. I mean, I know most people, most people listening are agency folks, but really for anybody in any business, some kind of industry specific group is valuable, regardless of how open or closed that industry is, because those people all do roughly the same thing you do. And then some kind of general business group where there's a lot of other businesses in there. And as an agency owner, that actually is a double-edged sword because one, we can learn from a lot of those people, but two, a lot of those people may also be prospects for us. Mm -hmm. So we kind of have a double value where some people may not. But I think regardless of the industry that you're in, being in those ty two types of groups, which was easier pre-COVID, but it's it's getting back to reality, um, is has been so helpful for me because I'm just able to ask questions and get answers to things that might have taken me years to figure out on my own uh, in the, in the early days by myself. Yeah, I agree. And I, and I like that, what I'll call sandwiching, right? So one is I think an industry specific group, right? Whether it's the DMG or, or some of the others um, that, that, that we're friends with, or it's, and along with rather like a YPO or a EO or a CEO council, it, it, it lends perspective. You're going to, all right, this is hyper-focused. This is what I do. These are people highly related to my issue. And then the others are Oh, I didn't even know that uh, that's what they do in the credit card business. Mm -hmm. So, yeah, I'm a firm believer of where you get that information. Uh, you should instill it. Um, all right. And so far as profitability, though, how, what was your attack on profitability? It seems like you you mentioned gross margin, you know, uh, net margin and then figuring that out. Like, how did you attack that? Well, I mean, I've always run a profitable business, so I've never not been profitable. I really believe in that. I, and But to be fair, I also had a little bit of a like a an advantage in that I started so young I didn't need to make very much money. I mean, I, I said the first year I made like $5,500. That was top line, not bottom. Although yeah. there was no real bottom line because I was the only expense. Um, and so like I had an advantage. I didn't need to make a lot of money very fast. But at the same time, the other advantage of the business that, that we're in is that it really shouldn't take that much overhead for somebody to get things going. I mean, if you got a computer and an internet connection, you got most of what you need, you know? Mm -hmm. And so at least to start. And where I where I ran into trouble with profitability was actually farther along in the game. Um, once I I was fine in the early years, but once I got to like I don't know maybe a million dollars in revenue, uh, and probably I don't know whatever that was seven seven or eight people. Um, that's when I started messing things up. Because I think that most people can wing it to about if they're smart enough and 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 are enough of a hustler and, and and smart enough to figure out figure out stuff themselves, they can wing it to about a million dollars, maybe ten people, and then after that, all the things that used to work start to kind of fall apart. And so what happened was we ended up building up different uh, revenue streams across the business, which is a good idea. You know, we had website hosting, website maintenance, marketing type services, uh, actual website building true de like app development and then now coaching. So there's actually six like P and L's within our business. Essentially. The problem was in those early years, they were all just like mushed into one thing. Mm. So it was like total revenue minus expenses, total profitability. I mean, it wasn't that basic, but in essence it was because what I couldn't do is tell you, well, is web hosting profitable? That division of the company is, 
you know, are websites themselves profitable? Is marketing, are our marketing retainers profitable? And, it, and at so, if so, at what level? And so one thing I had to figure out was I, I had to bring in somebody to help me with some of that accounting stuff, because while I can look at the reports and understand them really well, managing them and the details is certainly not my strength. So I hired basically like a virtual CFO once I crossed probably about a million and a half in revenue. Um, and that helped me a lot because we started looking at, all right, here's the six, five or six key areas of the business and let's separate out income and expenses for each one. And let's see like, and then we saw where the bleeding was. And all of a sudden I realized like we were losing money, making websites. We were making mm. better websites than we ever had we were losing significant money every year. And I'm like, this is dumb. You shouldn't do things that you lose significant money on unless maybe you can make an argument that they lead to much bigger things in other areas. Um, and so we just had to fix that. We had to adjust our pricing. We had to adjust our expenses. We had to adjust our structure a little bit. And so now, you know, I have directors in each one of those key areas and they're all responsible for their own P&Ls and, and they're bonused off of hitting particular metrics. So if they hit a particular gross margin, in a particular category that they're responsible for and they cross it, they make more money because the company's making more money. So there's more money to share around. That's how it works, you know? And so teaching those fundamentals to the team, even team members who may not really care that much. Um, there was a book that I read a while back uh, called The Great Game of Business. Mm -hmm. And it gets a little too detailed for me, but the idea is good, which is basically teach your team the fundamentals of business, keep a clear scorecard and, and make sure that everybody has an opportunity to win if the company wins. And so changing those things over time have really helped so that now I know every single category is profitable. Uh, and, and we know what those number, those goals are. And, and if they're not, we can go, oh, what happened here? Let, let's, let's fix that before it becomes a real problem. So with your P and L's for like each division, are those separate businesses or is that no. just the way? Okay. So you yeah. have it all under one, but that's just the way that you account for it. That's right. So I actually just talked to somebody else uh, who runs an agency, great guy. Um, and, and he actually is separating his business into like six mini businesses. To me, that just seemed like too much work, but it, it's going to, it makes sense for his style and how he wants to operate, which is fine. Again, ignore the system, but have a system. And, um, but for me, there's one, there's one QuickBooks account. There's one business. We just have them separated by class, essentially, not to get too much into the accounting conversation because everybody's going to fall asleep listening. But um, when I run a report and I can see it separated by class, so it'll take one P and L and just kind of blow it out into six divisions essentially. And so I can kind of see what's winning and what's losing whenever I want. So how long did it take to bring in that CFO to get it to that level where you were really understanding? It probably took them once they came in a solid, I don't know, year Mm. and a half maybe like that's a long time i know for some people but like it took that long to really get it right and get it dialed in um and and it's still always improving um you know i just recently elevated one of my long-term team members to president of the company and he actually went to last friday i had to be at an event and couldn't be there and we had like our financial review meeting and he did it for the first time without me there and like that's all progress towards where we're going, you know? Um, so every, every month, every quarter, every year we're looking at it and just asking like, how can it be better? How can it be better? What are we missing? Uh, what do we not know that we need to know? What are, what do we know that we don't need to know, you know? And, and we keep a tweaking those reports. I want things as simple as they can be, but I'm also a big progress over perfection guy. I, I don't, it doesn't need to be perfect. It just needs to be better than it was last year. Yeah, I think it's a great approach. And, and what I don't think a lot of people know is, yeah, the a good CFO is worth their weight in gold. Uh, what I mean, what they can find in your company and so find is find money out externally as well. Um, and I've heard from uh, quite a few. I have, I have a good friend that's a CFO. He said most CFOs take around two to three years to really set everything up the way that they're supposed to. And he said, and if somebody gets a really cush job at a, a big company, he's like, they don't really have to do a whole lot because it's all setting up the systems looking for, uh, you know, where, where's the profitability going to be? And then kind of a, a set it for, for forget it. Um, and then with that, how, what, what does your team structure look like now? I mean, you mentioned a president, like, tell me what that looks mm -hmm. like. Yeah. So it's interesting because the team's still pretty small internally. So the idea of having both the president and CEO seems kind of silly for some people. Internally, we have 15 full-time employees, but then we use a ton of contractors. So a few years back, I made a decision to kind of adjust 
how we were going to be structured into the future, which is pretty much how we're structured now. And the idea was essentially that our internal team, and by that I mean like full-time W-2 employees, um, were going to be leaders, managers, and strategists primarily, not primarily producers. And by producer, I mean, you know, a writer, a designer, a developer, somebody like that. And we would, we would contract out the vast majority of the other work. Now, I still have a copywriter on staff. I still have a video producer on staff, but even they are often managing those projects more than they are actually writing code or editing uh, video. Um, so that's kind of our structure right now. Um, I have a very light kind of... Um, team within each area so like on the development side i have a, a, a director of development in-house and i have a development support person and everything else is contracted out on the web side i have a web project manager and a web support uh, specialist and then basically everything else is contracted out but we have developed systems to make sure that the quality is super high the client's still getting high engagement on the marketing side each marketing team is essentially a marketing account manager and a marketing account coordinator so they're just little mini teams of two people for the most part across the entire company in different sections and so there's always duplicity they've always got a backup they don't feel like they're alone there's not one person who holds all the cards um and then they have teams of people uh, whether it's outside companies or outside individuals who we will hand off particular projects to. Some of those people are paid hourly. Some of them are paid by project. Some of them are paid monthly or on some kind of a retainer, but they are true contractors versus uh, employees. So that's how we're structured now. And that's been working really well. So what led you there? Did you blow up and have no uh, have less profitability or was this your method of scaling without incurring the cost? Yeah, I, I basically... A couple of things led me to it. One, I was just looking around at kind of the global economy and the ability to get good work all over the place. You know, I've got people uh, in India and in the Middle East doing development work. I've got people in the Philippines doing all kinds of different work. We've got tons of people here in the United States doing all kinds of work. And I think there was a season, which I think is past for the most part, whenever, whenever the word outsource was mentioned or offshoring, or you know, people were like, uh, like, and my thing is like, look, I mean, we would argue, I think most people would argue that like all people matter, like all around the whole world. And so we want to, we want to provide opportunities for people. So if I can provide a job to somebody anywhere in the world, that's great. That's good news, you know? And, um, but it's also requires a certain skill set. If you've never passed work off to somebody in a different culture, like their worlds are often very different, how they think, how they operate, and you can really mess yourself up. But I wanted to basically scale what I was do, what I used to do myself because I knew that by myself, I could produce a lot of work. And I thought, well, if I could teach somebody else to do the same thing internally and then give them support and backup, we really could scale to a much larger level. So, you know, we'll do over 3 million this year in revenue and we'll do it with 15 internal team members, which is pretty good yeah, um, on right. a revenue per employee basis. And, um, and I also felt like some of that outside work was going to get commoditized a little bit, which I think it has and it continues to be. Um, but that's not to say that I don't highly value producers i mean we've got we've got contractors who work with us for a long time who are amazing designers amazing copywriters and we always want to pay them whatever we can you know the most i want to pay them the most i can pay them because i want them to stay with me you know um but at the same time it allows us flexibility as well i think there's a lot of everybody's feeling I mean, especially after last year uncertainty in the world and this structure allows us to kind of scale up and scale down very quickly uh, because contractors don't have the same commitment as an internal team member uh, from a contract perspective or just a relationship perspective, really. Um, and so it kind of lets us breathe in and then breathe out if we need to. Last year uh, in the pandemic, I was a little overstaffed going in. So we were almost 20 team members at the beginning of last year. Thankfully, I didn't have to let anybody go, but I had a few people leave for different reasons, different opportunities. And we just decided not to replace those roles. We just adjusted the structure a little bit and then ended up outsourcing a lot of the actual work. So it's worked for us. I don't think it'd work for everybody. I have another agency owner who's a good friend of mine. He's like, I would never do that. Like I want, you know, my design talent in house and I want all this. And I'm like, that's great. That's the beauty of it. Is it what I do works for me and what you do works for you and keep moving forward and learn from each other. Yeah. It's not a right or wrong thing. It's what it works and doesn't work. That's right. The, so and then we're, I'd say we barely outsource anything like we'll outsource video and stuff. So I'd probably fall into that. It's, mm -hmm because it's a lot of that control mechanism. So that, that sure. that's what's interesting to me, but we're in, a lot of agencies outsource stuff to us because we have a really deep uh, tech bench and, you know, some, some pretty gnarly SEO chops, but 
um, along those lines, how much setup did it require for you to be able to see ship work outside or have work done outside of your agency? Like, do you have written processes? Like, what does that look like? Oh, yeah. Yeah. I mean, we're, we're pretty heavily systematized at this point. I mean, we have to be, otherwise it, it would be total chaos, you know? So, um, there's basically templated task lists. We use teamwork as our project management system. system. There's basically uh, templated task lists for all types of things that are repeatable uh, processes. I always tell my team though, look, if, if we got a better way to do it, we should change it to that. The only way, only reason we should keep doing things the way we've always done them is because they're still the best way. If we got a better way, we should do that instead. But um, we have a lot of systematized processes. We, we kind of went through like the pendulum swing on that, where it was like wild, wild west, no systems, no processes, no task lists, winging it off of my knowledge and a few other people's knowledge. And then we kind of swung the pendulum too far where it was like we were so process driven that people were like, well, hold on. This is not, we're not in step three. We can't, we can't go to step. I'm like, okay, <laughs> I understand, but you know, and so I think now we've kind of found a good middle ground. Um, but, you know, as far as outside contractors, most of them are people we've worked with for a long time. So we have really embedded relationships. And by a lot of standards, they would probably be in house people in some instances. But really, I always tell people you have to be careful about that too, because if they are an actual employee, you can get yourself in some tax trouble. Um, but from an IRS perspective, they basically say, like, if, if they get to decide what they're going to work on, where they're going to work, and when they're going to work, essentially, they can be a contractor. So I have a team member who is a contractor who used to be an employee. Um, but she decided she didn't want to come to the office anymore. She wanted to be remote. Um, and she only wanted to work on a particular type of project. And she wanted to work unusual hours that were outside of our standard. And it was at the same time I was considering contracting some of this work out. And I was kind of like, well, let's try this thing where you can kind of do all those things. That makes you not a team. You're not held by the same rules that the rest of the ship is held by um, as a result of that. And we'll see if it works. And it's been, it's been probably two years now since that change. And it's been spectacular. So for, for her and for us. And so I think um, having the right processes and systems in place is an absolute mandate before trying to do that. Because what I didn't want to happen over any of that was to lose quality. But we've not. I mean, in any, any website that we're launching now, I mean, I, anything we've launched in the last couple of years is better than anything we did years ago and with an in-house team. And I, again, I don't think there's a right or wrong way. I think the way that we manage, especially in this remote world, you know, where everybody's kind of gone remote now, we're not, we're kind of a hybrid setup. But um, I think that outside contractors have become not that much different in many cases than inside team members in, in many organizations. I also think that's why we're dealing with so much turnover in some places, but that's a whole nother, that's a whole nother podcast probably. <laughs> the uh no i probably want to touch on that too in a minute so um if, if you had to tell another agency like hey this is how you start uh, the the process of creating processes what would you recommend there uh one I, I always try and lean on things that already exist so um for us we delve pretty heavily into traction or eos mm -hmm. um from that's not familiar with that there's a book called traction by a guy named gino wickman and it's not agency specific really any business could operate off of it um what that is not is like how do i run a social media campaign but what it is is how do i run the company so once we put that in place now we had a system for the whole thing like the the company's operation as a whole literally and they call it an entrepreneurial operating system for a reason um, and then within that, we started to evaluate like what needs to happen, what needs to be detailed. And, um, you know, a couple things helped. One was me getting away from the company more because what I found was I had been around for so long that I at least thought I had the answers to most things or was willing to figure them out. And so I became like the human knowledge base. And so people would be like, Hey Jay, what do you think about this? Hey Jay, what do you think about that? And I would try and answer the question. And so as I started to go on vacation more and get myself away, I would tell the team anywhere that you say to yourself, we have to wait till Jay gets back to decide what to do here. That's a problem that needs to be fixed and a process that needs to be documented. And so we try for the most part to document the, the biggest broad level stuff first because the details often change. And then even using tools like Loom, you know, stuff like that that allow you to record videos a lot of what we do, you can do a quick video and show somebody how to do something. And I think that's sometimes better than being like, here's a 20 step task list of how to do this. Let me just show you real quick on a 60 second video instead. 
how often do you guys revisit your processes? I mean, specifically like quarterly. So there's a large kind of company wide process doc that gets reviewed quarterly based on the teams. But but at any point, really, if somebody says, "Hey, well, I don't know why we're doing it this way," we should go back and adjust that, adjust whatever the template task list is, is and go from there. Yeah, and then let's 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 shift it over and speak about culture. I, I want to hear mm -hmm. your, your your thoughts on that. So yeah, why do you think there's so much um, resignation? Well, yeah. So this whole great resignation thing's wild. Um, I think that number one, I think going through something like the pandemic that we all went through is something we've, we've never experienced. I mean, I, like I said, I've been in business for over 20 years and I've never had anything like last year. That was crazy. Like, and, and, Fortunately, we're in Florida, so it's a little bit easier as far as like openness of business compared to some places in the world, but really most places in the world probably, but, but still it was scary, you know? Um, but I think that the reason people are leaving is they got a taste of what life might be like if they didn't have to show up at the office or do that thing that they always hated. And I think that there's a lot of stuff in our culture, American culture as a whole, and maybe it's global culture, I don't even know where people are like, Oh, Monday, you know, yeah. I hate Monday. And, and look, like, I don't care what you do. You're going to hate it at least, you know, 10% of the time. It's just the way life is. There's going to be hard days, but if every single Monday people are waking up and going, this sucks, I don't want to do this. There's a problem. And I think there were a lot of people doing that. And I think, I think there were a lot of people that had to deal with stuff that at companies that maybe wasn't best and they found something different. And, and also like, you know, companies are their own things and leaders of those companies have to make decisions about how they want to operate. I know a lot of agencies, I would say maybe most, a lot of agencies that have now gone full remote. That's not my gig. I don't want to do that. I, I did that for 16 years. I did it before it was cool, you know, um, and, <laughs> and I just don't want to do that anymore. I also don't want to mandate people be in the office Monday to Friday, eight to six or something like that. You know, that's not my style either. That's Dave Ramsey's style. That's not my style. And so, you know, I think you've got to find your own way. And sometimes, you know, when a company or a leader of that company says, hey, this is the way we're going to operate, there's going to be people who go, well, you know what? I want to travel around and don't want to work that way anymore. Okay, that's fine. But for us, we've been very fortunate, knock on wood. Um, I don't, we've not lost anybody as a result of the pandemic. Uh, we've lost people for, that have decided to go to different opportunities, but it would have been no different in, in regular life or we had a performance issue, things like that. But, but, but nothing that was specifically pandemic related. Um, and I think it's because of our core values. I mean, they're literally drawn up on the wall behind me. It's one thing to draw them up. It's another thing to live them out, but that's how we evaluate the team. It's not just based on performance. It's like, is this person aligned with who we say we are as a company? And if they're not, then they shouldn't work here. Not, not just for us, but for them. You know, there's plenty of people who, who, who were amazing fits, amazing at their job who might not be a good fit here. And that's okay, you know? And I think that over time, we have to figure out like, who, who are the kind of people that we want to work with? Not just what job do we want them to get them done. And that's a big delineation for me between a contractor and a, and a team member as well, or some people would say an employee, is that like an, a team member or an employee, somebody that's in-house, should be fully aligned with our core values, or at least 80%. Let's put it that way. Nobody's fully aligned. I'm not. I'm not <laughs> one time I was like seventh out of 15th when we rated everybody on the core values <laughs> alignment. And I was like, oh, well, this is awkward. <laughs> Glad so this was anonymous. <laughs> <laughs> and, um, but contractors, they may not have to have that tight of an alignment. A, a contractor, for the most part, I need them to do a job. I need them to complete a project. I need them to get a task done. A team member, I need to know their kids' names. I, I need to know like how they're doing. I need to know. And that's just me. Some people are like, that's not how we operate. I don't want to get personal. Fine. I, that's not how I think. I think everything's personal. And so that's how I, that's how I want to care for my team. Like they're, you know, like they're family, you know, maybe better than family sometimes. Uh, and so that's how I think about it. I think that deciding who you are as a company and, and are you actually the core values that you wrote up on your wall um, matters a lot. And when you're not, I think people go, I'm out of here. Um, and sometimes people self-select out because they know they're not aligned with it. And that's okay too. But I think core values, a clear mission, giving people purpose. People need to have, people want to have purpose and meaning. People always talk about trash about millennials. And I'm like, look, 
I think there's two kind of millennials. There's the kind of millennial who like wants to be in their mom's basement. Not that we have basements here, but they want to be in their mom's basement and play Xbox all day. And there's the kind of millennial who's like just an incredibly hard worker, cares deeply about the people around them and, and wants to hustle. I think, I think that's probably true for most generations, you know, but I, the one thing I do think is true about like the younger generation, I put in air quotes cause I'm quit rapidly ascending out of that generation <laughs> um, uh, is I think they want purpose. And if it's just about putting pixels on a screen, that's not very interesting. But if what we do helps somebody else grow their business, if what we do helps somebody else put food on their table and provide for their dreams and make something happen that they might not have happened otherwise and create an opportunity for all their people, think about the multiplication of what's happening there. Think about the impact that can create in the communities and the places around us. Think about the, the people that work there that can then donate to nonprofits and organizations that they care about. Now, all of a sudden, it's a lot more than pixels on screens. And I think that that kind of purpose stuff is not just like, I used to think it was like mushy, I don't know, like counselor stuff. And it's mm. not. It matters. If you believe in it, it's it's awesome. It yeah. sucks when somebody tries to jam it down your throat and it's just a complete disconnect. It's like I've seen core values that are table stakes going back to some of them. Yeah. And it's just like it's like honesty, integrity. Uh, it's like all these things that, yeah, you wouldn't hang out with somebody if they didn't have those anyway. Right. And yeah. So at, at that point or even uh, where people will say, all right, yeah, we're, we're here to help businesses put food on the table, like you said. And it's like, yeah, but then you guys are all doing payday loan websites. So I mean, I think <laughs> right, there's a right, that's right. Yeah, it's just you're literally, you know, uh, your your modern day loan sharks uh, for the most part. Um, but I, I'm with you. I, I think purpose is super important. I love getting personal with people. And I know that's uh, not not some others uh, styles for sure. It's fine. What about like uh, like mechanisms, events, and things like that for your culture? Like, can you oh, speak yeah. to that? Yeah, for sure. Um, I try to be really intentional about this. I think it matters more now than it maybe ever has. One big thing that we do every year and have done for ages is something called workcation. So every summer, um, I take the team and their spouses on vacation of some sort. Um, back in the day, we used to take everybody. So when there was only like five of us at one point for a couple of years, it was like five guys and we were all like roughly the same age and all had young children. And I would rent these huge beach houses and we would take everybody, including the children. There are many of my team members now who would not want 30 children descending on a house. <laughs> that would not be a fun weekend. Um, and so that's had to change over time, but the idea hasn't changed. And the idea is we got to get away and maybe we'll do some things that might be helpful or educational or some strategy stuff, but that's not the purpose. The purpose is to have a good time, to break bread together and just be in each other's company. And so I, I decided a long time ago to, to let people or have people bring spouses with them. It doesn't always work out schedule wise and it changes. Some years we'd, we've done cruises, we've done beach resorts, we've done, you know, a, a lake house, you know, all that kind of stuff. And it's something to look forward to all year. So it's like, wow, you know, in the summer we're going to have this big event. And then because usually, you know, you spend a long weekend away, you usually have some funny stories and some great memories. And those last for months after that. And then and then usually uh, we'll have some kind of big Christmas party as well. So there's two kind of big anchoring events for the year, one every six months. And then more on the strategy or business side, every quarter, uh, not only do we have a leadership team meeting, but we also have a team um, meeting. Um, like a, we call it a quarterly rock party. And the reason it's called that is uh, our quarterly objectives are called rocks. I'm going to know all that, but some of y'all know what that means. Oh, yeah. And, um, and so every quarter we'll get together and we spend a whole day. And usually the morning will be some kind of group training or education. How can we continue to grow and learn more together? And then the afternoon will be, Hey, last quarter, we said we were going to do this. Here's what we did. Um, and then that team, how did y'all do? What did you say you do? did you do it? That team, what'd you say you do? Did you do it? Um, and then we, we say, Hey, here's the company's objectives for the next quarter. And then each department then helps define their own objectives for that quarter. But it's not just work. We always try to make it a little fun. So we'll do games. We'll bring in a big lunch. We might have a little party afterwards, you know? And so we try and make it a fun thing too, but that's expensive. It's expensive to take an entire day, um, once a quarter and do that. It's expensive to take a whole team on vacation once summer. It's expensive for those big holiday parties. And I think we're entering a world where people think that they can just skip that stuff. And if they do, they are going to lose their team members. Um, because as much as people think like they want to separate work and life, and they just want to go get their work done. I don't think that's true. We spend too much time working for it to not also be a little bit fun 
and actually like the people that you're around. So those big anchoring events for us are really powerful. We'll, we'll do other random stuff too. Like one of the team members started doing, once we went more remote than we have been, started doing like Taco Tuesday lunches. So there's a little Mexican place up near our office and uh, not everybody comes, but if you're in the office that day, you're probably going to go get tacos. And those are things that like the company's going to pay for most of the time. Um, and they're fun they're memorable and it just breaks you out of the cycle of, Hey, what's the update on that project? You know? Um, and that we find, I've found that to be valuable. Plus I just enjoy it, you know? So <laughs> it's selfish yeah. or anything else. No. And I agree with that. And I think that's, it's something else. A lot of candidates are asking like, all right, what is the culture? Like, what do you guys do for fun? And that we're, we're getting interviewed now because these tables have turned and it's important, yeah. man. Like who wants to go to a place where it sucks to work? Right. right. You want to be appreciated. You, of course, want to get paid well. But at the end of the day, if you can have a little bit of fun while you do it, all right, that, that can be a big uh, game changer and move people toward your direction. Yeah. And, and I think that it's easy to, you know, sometimes that pen, like same thing, sometimes the pendulum can swing a little too far one way or the other. And thankfully, the, the people on our team are are clear enough with their communication where they go, Hey, you know, we, we really need like a break. We need like a day where we're all getting together and just have a little fun because things, yeah. this has been a tough season or this particular set of clients has been really hard or whatever it is. I mean, the, the, the truth is like client services is hard work. You're dealing with a lot of people and a lot of different personalities internally, externally. And when you do that, people get stressed out. And when people get stressed out, they quit. And especially right now where there's all kinds of different opportunities that are, you know, being dangled in front of folks. Um, there has to be more than money and benefits for somebody to stay. Because if, if you're, I think this is true about people as much as it's about products, is if, if, my, if my only value to a client is I'm going to be cheaper than the other person, I mean, it's a race to the bottom. I have no interest oh, in yeah. that. And it's the same thing with hiring. If my only value is that I'm going to pay you more than the next person is, it's a race to the top. And I'm not interested in that either. And it's not because I'm cheap. I want to pay people as much as I possibly can pay them. But like it's it's about more than that, because if if you're going to, you know, if and if somebody's going to go to somebody else just because they're going to give them five percent more than I will or 10 percent more even in some cases, like they're probably not a good fit here anyway. Mm -hmm. and that's fine. And so it can't just be about the money and benefits. If it is, you're not going to be able to keep people very long, especially in this environment. Yeah, I agree. There has to be a cohesion um, amongst the staff. And that's where I think core values and all these other things that you mentioned in the events is, is really important to that. Now, what about, like, what do you see that a, a lot of agencies are in this industry is, is not working or is wrong or that, that agencies could fix? Any patterns? Oh, gosh. I've got enough of my own issues to talk about other people's issues. But I, <laughs> I, think, um, I think that people will find that this idea of, like, everyone going full remote, like, all of the sudden is a bad idea. I think that it's the same thing about anything else. Like all of one thing is usually a bad thing. Mm -hmm. I know plenty of people who have run very successful fully remote agencies and they've done it for a very long time. That is a different thing than somebody who has ran a full office environment and all of a sudden they're like, oh, we're remote now because the government made us be and so we're just going to stay that way because we can save a couple grand a month on our office. Yep. Eh, if that's the only reason, I'd be really careful. Um, and I think that that's a danger risk point for people. Um, again, not, my way is not necessarily the best way we've changed. We were fully remote. Then we were fully in the office. Then we were kind of like somewhat flexible. Now we're very flexible, but we still, everybody has to be in the office two days a week. That's our general kind of expectation. But that limits us a little bit too, because it means I'm not going to hire a full-time team member who is in, you know, California, uh, our contractor out there, but I won't hire a full-time team member. And so I think that that's the biggest risk that I see right now is people trying to only focus on the dollars, the cents and all that. And if they miss the people along the way, they're going to have a problem, a much bigger problem, which is going to produce money problems. Um, and I think, I think that, that uh, the focus, we all felt, I mean, I don't think anybody in business didn't feel a significant amount of fear and pain last year um, in 2020. And m many people that carried into 2021, but um, it can't just all be about cash and savings and and hedges of protection. It has to be about the people. Yeah, no, I agree. But I mean, you're in Florida like we are, so everybody from California is moving here anyway. That's true. That's true. <laughs> so I, I know we spoke about challenges. What about a biggest failure? Is there a biggest failure that you can share? 
Hmm. Gosh, I don't know if I had like one biggest failure that really comes to mind. There's been a lot of little ones along the way, but I think one thing I say about failures is part of my job as a leader is actually to create an opportunity where people have the opportunity to fail, just not fail catastrophically. Mm. And so I've never had a catastrophic failure. If I had, I wouldn't still be in business um, and growing every single year. Um, individual failures, though, I think um, the biggest things that come to mind are like a, taking on the client or taking on the prospect as a client who you know is going to be a problem. You know, and everybody that's been around in business long enough has done this. Oh, where yeah. you're like, I, I know, I know there's like a lot of red flags, but like we really need the money or, you know, gosh, they'd be good to have on our portfolio or whatever. And you just know. And when you, when you have that gut feeling, it almost always, almost always ends in a place where you're like, yep, I shouldn't have taken that client. And I, I have done that so many times that you think I would learn at this point. Um, but then also holding on to legacy clients. Uh, one of the things that happened for us this year, beginning of this year, was we had to transition away um, a longtime client who produced a ton of our revenue, as mm. in like a half million dollars a year kind of wow. revenue. Yeah, it was a lot. And there were a lot of different reasons for that, which I won't go into, but it ended up in a place where, to be honest, it wasn't the, be the best fit for either one of us. And so in that scenario, I had to go, okay, I'm... I'm, I'm, I mean, we're only going to make 3 million this year. Five, 500,000 is a lot of that, you know, and that's mm. a scary thing with a small team. It's easy to replace a hundred thousand dollar client or $50,000 client. It's not easy to replace a half million dollar client, especially one that's annually recurring. Um, and so, you know, but at the same time, I think maybe we held onto them too long. Maybe we should have helped them transition to their own team and their own process sooner. And that's what ended up happening. It actually ended up good for everybody. We ended up transitioning them to their own internal team. And I helped them get that set up because it was the right thing to do. So I'm always really careful. I don't think I've ever burned any major bridges, although there may be somebody out there listening who's like, oh, yeah, you burnt my bridge. Um, I hope that's not true. If there is, you should reach out to me and I apologize. Um, but I try my absolute best not to burn bridges bridges you know with with people regardless of how nasty it gets um but i would say my biggest failures have been taking on clients i knew i shouldn't have taken and then letting legacy clients stay just because of the money um that's not a good reason there's always more and the proof of that is as scary as it was in january of this year we're up 20 plus percent without that client and and that's that's a testament to the endurance and the perseverance of my team for sure but it's also like an example of there's nobody that you have to have as a client. You can go find somebody else. My uncle always told me, lose one client, go get two more. Yeah, yeah. Every, everybody's replaceable. I'm a firm believer of that. Also had a client once that said, you know what? Uh, throughout his career, he said, I, I haven't burned bridges. He's like, I have nuked them. Oh, gosh. <laughs> Red flag. Red <laughs> flag. Yeah, it was crazy, man. Yeah, we didn't have him as a client too long. Actually, our bridge wasn't nuked or burned. Yeah, it just turned out it wasn't really a good fit. Yeah. The um, So, uh, yeah, is there anything that we haven't covered today that you believe the world should know? Well, I would say, like, to, to agency owners out there, or even leaders, maybe you're not the owner, maybe you're just a leader in an organization, is it's easy to end up feeling stressed out and worn out and ready to quit. You see team members quitting around you and you're like, half the time I see, I know people who are leaders who are like, I wish I could quit, but I feel kind of chained to my own business. You have to get around people and have a plan to not do that. And, and for people, especially, this especially applies to people that are married. We haven't talked about, you know, family and, and life and all that much. But for me, that's a big deal. I got five kids who are nine wow. to 17. And for you. <laughs> thanks. Sometimes it's good for me. Sometimes it's not. Um, <laughs> and, and I care deeply about, you know, what their perception is, not, not the reality, what their perception is of how life is right now and what that's going to look like 20 years from now. I, I care deeply about, you know, what my, my relationship with my wife is going to look like. We've been married almost 20 years. I care deeply about what that looks going to look like 40 years from now. And, and so it's so easy to get caught up in the day to day of like, well, I got to get through this project. Once they get through this project, then I'll take a break. And those are, everybody that's listening knows what this, they've been around long enough, you know what this is like, because I've done it. Well, once I get through this client, then, then I'll take a break. Then I'll take a vacation. I spent probably a decade um, where I didn't take a real vacation. Mm -hmm. I mean, I would, I would go away, but I'd have my phone or my laptop or whatever else. 
And it was very clear, even though if somebody were to ask me, hey, what are your priorities? I'd be like, well, you know, God, my marriage, my children. The real priority was the business, 100%. And I, the example I always give people is if you say that your spouse, not this is a marriage show, but if you say that your spouse is your most important priority or your children are, or somebody else in your life. And um, I always give the example, if you were sitting down with your most important client ever, or the prospect that you've always wanted to have, and somebody calls, and they're not that important. Would you take the call? Of course not. Do you do you do that with your spouse or your children? When maybe you shouldn't. I mean, I have. Like I'm not. I'm not like trying to crucify anybody. But I think that's the the biggest thing that I would want people to know is like the business can make it without you for a weekend. Mm -hmm. It can make it for you without a week. La last year was the first time I ever did this, but um, I took. 30, almost 35 days off in the middle of the summer. We took an RV mm. trip around the country with the kids and I didn't work at all. I didn't check email. I didn't check text messages. I had things in place because we'd planned it ahead of time. And I was like, don't, don't call me. Like, it'll be fine. Y'all figure it out. And if you can't, well, what's the worst thing that happened? We lose some money <laughs> and we're not in the ER business. Nobody's dying today, you know? And, um, and it was great. It wasn't just great for me though. It was great for the company because if the company hinges on me, and I walk out in the street, get hit by a bus. I don't know why it's always a bus, but that's what people say. If I walk out in the street, get hit by a bus, like everybody has a problem. Everybody's probably going to lose their job very quickly because the company's not going to survive. And so I want it to last without me for my the sake of my marriage. I want it to last without me for the sake of my children and for the sake of my team. And so I think the arrogance of the belief that like I have to be there because I have to be the one that's going to get this thing done you are lying to yourself and you need to be a better leader and help bring along other people to get that done. I had to do that and I'm still learning because I think, um, I think it's a never ending process. Yeah, I agree. And I think the reason they say a bus is because it's where well, they're pretty confident. You're not getting, <laughs> that's, right, that's, right. Right. that's a good point. <laughs> I've never heard uh, somebody explain that, but that makes a lot of sense. <laughs> the, um, so, so what, what does your sales structure look like? Where, where does most of your business come from? Um, I would say that most of our business comes from uh, relational stuff. I mean, we, we do a lot of our own, you know, typical online advertising and lead gen through our website and stuff like that. And we get we get some business from that, too. But a lot of it is uh, webinars. So I'll do a webinar every single month, which builds an audience. Um, I've got like a lot of different tentacles out there as far as like um, personality building. So I wrote a book. I have a podcast. I do monthly webinars. I'll speak at live events. Um, and so as I'm saying this, it actually contradicts what I just said, which is that it can't be all be about me. Um, and so that's actually a problem that we're dealing with right now. One of the issues on our list for our annual is a lot of our leads come from me, me at events, me speaking on stage, me on podcasts. Um, and that's not sustainable because if I were to go away and I'm the one that's bringing in the new leads, where is that happening? Um, and then probably 75% of our business is recurring as well. So uh, we have a lot of recurring revenue, a lot of longtime clients. That is one advantage of being in business for 20 plus years. There's just a lot of long-term relationships um, that feed the business. That's another thing my uncle told me when I was young is, you know, the best way to grow a business, just do a great job for somebody, ask them to tell somebody else. And that's true regardless of what industry that you're in. Yeah, I think that's a fantastic uh, line to close on. But one more question. How can people get a hold of you? The best way to find me personally is my own website. It's jowenlive.com, J-A-Y-O-W-E-N live.com. And uh, that links to my podcast and book and agency and everything else. Awesome. Jay, thank you so much, man. Appreciate you sharing and being open and genuine with us. Really appreciate your time today. Yeah, John, thanks for having me. Hope you enjoyed our episode. Please subscribe and review wherever you can. And if you would like to join the Digital Mastermind, go ahead and shoot me an email at john, J-O-N, at digitalmastermind.com or visit us at digitalmastermind.com. We'll see you next time. Thanks. Bye now.